All right. Good afternoon, everyone, or at least to those of you that are on the East Coast uh, and in the BNH area. Welcome to this session of the BNH event space. My name is Pete Isgrig. Uh, I am with Western Digital and Sandisk. I am the uh, rep that works with the BNH account, and uh, I am here presenting RJ uh, with uh, this event for you guys. So, uh, welcome. I'm going to pass it over to RJ. I don't have a whole lot to say, but we're just happy you're here. And uh, if you guys watching on the live streams or in the audience um, on the Zoom, if you have questions, put it in the Q&A, put it in the comment section, and uh, I will be monitoring that. And I'll be uh, talking with RJ throughout this and asking your questions. So please give us those. And uh, without further ado, RJ, take it away. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Pete. All right. Hello, everyone. I am going to share my screen here. Hopefully you can see this. Um, this yep. is my talk on giving value to photography collectors. And before we jump into the presentation, um, I wanted just to say thank you for being here. I know this is a wonderful platform to share ideas. I'm a big fan of this notion of um, a rising tide raises all ships and this notion of sharing that there's no secrets as being um, in the art world i like to you know if i learn something i want to pass it on to uh, my friends my and this is just a wonderful platform for me to do that so um without further further ado um sit tight we're gonna get started um, I wanted to give a special thanks to BNH Photo Video and uh, out in New York um, for hosting me on this event space page, as well as SanDisk um, for uh, giving some support to us. Um, I work with two wonderful galleries, uh, the Veronique, Veronique Wentz Gallery in Minneapolis and Olson Larson Galleries in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, and I wanted to give a special shout out to my publisher in Brooklyn, MW Editions, as well as Kara Verlag in Germany. I've been fortunate to publish with both of those wonderful publishers and with it's a, it's a teamwork effort. So, um, you know, the big picture here is where we're going to go. A little outline on um, this notion of what I like to think is building value, um, which is more than just like a financial value, but it's relationships. It's um, that good feeling that you, one would get when, you know, maybe you buy a piece of artwork that you're looking at almost every day that offers inspiration. Um, so as an artist, I feel like that's one of the big things other than creating great art and great work is to forge these connections with collectors, um, gallerists. Uh, photo editors, perhaps at magazines, curators. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about how we can get work into a museum collection. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what provenance is and how that adds value uh, to both museum curators and photographer collectors. Um, if you don't know what a certificate of authenticity is, now is your time to learn. Um, this is often something that is not taught in an MFA program, but yet I find vital in the photography world um, for those who are selling photo photographs as fine art. And uh, I'll give you a little tips and tricks on building your CV. Um, and, you know, if you only are tuning in, and this is the only 30 second message uh, that you hear, I would just say act with love to everyone you meet. Um, that's that I think is the biggest, most important thing. Treat everyone with the respect that they deserve. And, uh, you know, it's a small world. People talk, people share, and you want to really just be one of those people that you're proud to be. Um, now, if you're going to give get the maybe the two minute Cliff's Notes version here as you're maybe rewatching this, I'm going to go ahead and give you kind of the, the overall Cliff Notes, like if all you have is two minutes. And then the next 50 minutes is maybe you don't have time for. So I would say if you connect with a collector, maybe at your gallery solo exhibition and they acquire one of your prints, um, maybe two of your prints. I think if you are able to give them a completed monograph that you've recently published, which would serve almost as like a catalog to your work, um, ha might have supporting essays, by a curator describing your work. I feel like that's a really, so it's like a landmark in your career. It takes a lot of time, energy, 
costs <laughs> involved, financial costs in producing a monograph. Um, and so I th think it's one of those gifts that the value of the object is um, is far less. It's not. It's, it's very insignificant in terms versus the the sentiment, the thoughts. Like, oh wow. You know, this artist gave me this his book too that you know so in, in the the artwork that I have on my wall is in this book right and that way if they have a friend that comes over and at their you know gallery or their studio or wherever the art your, their house where their artwork is hanging you know you could quickly pick the book off the shelf hand it to your friends like, yep this is part of a bigger project that might be a long-term effort and then the, your, your friend that you're introducing uh, this work that, that's hanging on the wall has a bigger sense like oh it's just not this one standalone image right um, I think a second idea here to offer value to collectors is, you know, mail them a handwritten thank you note. If you can get their address, that's wonderful. I know a lot of galleries, their client list is proprietary, and so they won't often share that with you. Um, but if you have their uh, address, I think that's a really nice sentiment. Um, I, I feel like the days of email, people are bombarded, text messages, I think tend not to be as um, sentimental. Um, you can't hold on to it per se or put it in the bookmark uh, in the book. So that's a really nice thing. Um, I think keeping them on your mailing list as you're having shows come about, um, big announcements. I mean, I love getting snail mail. Um, and I think a lot of photographers fail to realize like, wow, that makes a difference. It, it makes people remember you. Um, and I, I think that's just part of that experience, right? Um, I think professionally package your work as you uh, after the sale, um, making sure that it arrives safe. Um, I will show you how I package my prints and what I include with those prints um, and give you some little pointers on um, where I, I get my packaging supplies and how I keep it efficient because it's that's the last thing I want to do is, you know, waste a lot of time and having a print returned if it's damaged, um, you know. And then a simple thing is I use addition to prints. So let's say it's an addition of three for my large size. If number one, number two sell, um, and then someone buys the third or acquires the third print, the last print in the edition, I love making a phone call to that collector that purchased or acquired that first print and that second print. Um, because basically it's A, you know, that you're they're saying like, okay, now that edition is sold out. Um, and the basic laws of e uh, economic supply, I feel like the less there is of something, the, the more value it's worth. And so if it's sold out, like what they have is value and that no one else can buy that size of a photograph. Um, and um, I think if, if the work, especially if you use tiered pricing, um, I, I increase my price with the, each print as it sells out. And it's like, hey, you might have paid X for print one. And the print for print three might be X times two, let's say. Um, and then there's like, wow, your investment's been realized. Um, now, I never think of art necessarily as a financial investment. Um, it is an asset class for a lot of um, institutions that collect. I know like the Fidelity Investments, they have a corporate asset where they collect fine art. Um, the, the core of the day, as they call it, um, the art of the day uh, on their walls. And yet it has value as well. Um, I always say, you know, pick up the phone with a collector if you get an image that gets published in a magazine. I think that's great. Or it's acquired by an institution or a public museum, for example. I think that shows like, hey, this person is, you know, wanting to support you as the artist. And I think that's, a, you know, giving them thanks, keeping them in the loop. They're your fans, right? The fans love to follow their favorite bands in the music world. Well, the same can be said about the art world. Um, and then finally, if you know you have an artist that um, or a, a collector that acquires one of your prints and might be new to collecting per se, you know, give them an, um, some recommendations on some of that can maybe help safely install work. Um, gosh, you know, if they're hanging it over a fireplace and the fireplace is is concrete or tile or stone and they don't have the proper tools, that that you know, investment could easily crash, um, fall from the wall in the middle of the night. And that's the last thing you want to wake up to is damaged artwork. Um, 
And so getting professional art installation, I think is really helpful to minimizing damage to the artwork as well. So if you're if you're in the city, you're like, hey, this is a trusted person, give them their, their information so they can connect with them quickly, okay? Um, finally, I, I would say that if the work is damaged, um, offer to replace that at cost. Um, now granted your costs might increase with time, but that's just peace of mind that, you know, like within your lifetime, like if you're a digital, um, if you're printing archival pigment prints, for example, that you know you can replace that. Now, if it's a one of a kind piece, that, that's a little bit different. But if you print in additions and you have that capability, I feel like that does offer value um, to a collector. Or if, or if it gets scratched, for example, while it's being um, framed, right? That, then that, that way they, they don't have to go through um, an insurance claim and that sort of thing. So those are just some big things. Now, I'm a big top 10 list person. And so we're going to delve into the overview in a little bit greater detail here um, in this top 10 list. So the top 10 thing I would say, number 10, um, for creating value for fine art photography collectors is just keep making art. You know, don't stagnate. I think a lot of um, artists, like, they feel like they maybe if they've been producing art for 30, 40 years, they think like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still getting better. Um, I'm still producing work but that they haven't really learned anything maybe new or had something that to really push them to maybe explore a different medium or a new tool. Um, and so I, I, I encourage you to ask yourself, are you getting better or are you getting worse? And you, you wanna be maybe not necessarily photographer A, that your skills remain flat. Um, of course, you don't wanna be photographer B, where your skills slowly soften over time, right? So I suggest, you know, this notion that there is no such thing as a plateau. You're, you're either going to get better or you're going to get worse. And one of the things I think that's improved, that, that helps you improve your craft, A, going to virtual seminars, learning, I think is a really pivotal thing. Um, and so I wanted to share with you um, the green here, this is like a project timeline from my last major project, which began in 2015, and it was debuted in 2022. So this is a seven-year effort, and throughout, you'll see in green, those are all like learning experiences that I've done or workshops, and um, I think that's really vital to avoid burnout, to making sure that you're staying um, current with practices and techniques. Um, and that helps me out, I found. So just wanna share that with you. Um, and it keeps going. And um, whether it be, it's, I think musicians find the same thing. If you're just focusing on one music, if you're a guitar player, for example, and you've never picked up a banjo or um, an ukulele, right? And you're traveling to Hawaii. Why not learn something new? Because there's so many of those skills that can transfer, right? So for photography, for me, learning video, learning audio recording, um, honing your writing skills. Um, I think all of that is very helpful in your practice. Um, fuel your mind, I think, is a really important thing to avoid stagnation. Um, if you've ever heard of Perry Photo, it's the largest art fair for photography. It's in Paris. Um, and it's in November every year. I didn't go there. You said his research. Um, you, you'd be surprised the people that you'll meet. Um, of course, at BNH, you're lucky to have uh, the, the New York City museums at your doorstep that you can walk to. Um, but I think, you know, going to museums, it, you know, I, I think good, good stuff in yields good stuff out. Junk in yields junk out. So it's, you know, um, learning, you know, and if you don't, if you don't have a major library or a, a museum nearby, maybe go to your library and, and pick up some photo books, um, art books, and uh, art history books, and kind of read. And I feel like that in the big picture helps to create energy um, needed for that what I call the ten thousand hours of success that it makes an, a hit, right? 
Um, I would say, you know, this really important um, in the art world, there are these people called curators, and they're often academically trained with advanced degrees, and they're very much the tastemakers in the art world. Um, they often work on long-term projects, whether it be a book publication on a certain topic, or they're curating exhibitions um, that they're very, take years, some exhibitions to put together. And they're often wanting to stay abreast, much like the artist of what's the cutting edge art, technology, presentation, thematic approaches to work. So connecting with curators, I think, is really important. And one of the places I like to connect with curators um, on I, I, where they're available is, you know, going to portfolio reviews. And here I am with um, uh, some of my work. Uh, this is at PhotoFest in Houston, which is the largest portfolio review in the world. And uh, this was in 2020, actually. Um, and, you know, the, you it gives you an opportunity to sit across the table, get to know them, and you'll never know where that might lead. It's the beginning of a relationship, if you will. Now, I do have a talk coming up that will be very specific to portfolio reviews, potentially if you're preparing for your first. So that would be a good a good lecture to walk, listen to. Um, but here's here's a good example where I was sitting at the table. Uh, I had a wonderful review with Audrey Sands. She's a curator at the Center for Creative Photography and um Arizona, and she's smelling my leaf behind, which has lavender oil. So it's this very, of the senses are just very, it smells great. Um, so that was a wonderful example of, of just kind of a genuine connection as a thank you. I handmade a portfolio leaf behind. Um, Oftentimes, this is at the filter portfolio reviews. This was last fall in 2022. And this is Karen Haas, who's the Lane Curator of Photography at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And I reviewed with her several years prior, just when I was beginning this fine art project called The Unchosen Ones. And you can learn more about that on my website. Uh, but I gave her a completed monograph. Um, so she was able to see the entire project um, in, in, in this published version. And so that's, it's kind of like when they help, curators help um, advise you on projects, they, they like to know that maybe that advice that they're giving you is, is helpful. Um, same thing here with Alexa Dilworth. She's down in um, North Carolina, at the Duke Center for Documentary Studies. Um, again, a wonderful portfolio reviews are a wonderful way to uh, connect with these curators. Um, that are working on projects. And you never know if the project that they're working on, or maybe they have several projects, could fit into what you're exploring as an artist. All right. So number eight in my uh, tips on how you can give value to collectors, I would, I would say really understand how museums acquire artwork. Um, it's there, There's often, there can be some mystique in how art appears on the walls of museums. But there's, I feel like, no real secrets. Um, I think a lot of curators are very, um, op have open door policies about how they acquire work. There's often information on the websites of, of museums on their collection policies or acquisition policies, but often realize that there's this um, relationship. And I, I draw this square between the artist, the gallery, um, the curator, and the collector. And if you go to an art fair, it's fascinating where you go in the booth and you can actually listen in on some of these conversations with, you know, there's the gallerists that spend, paid a lot of money to have this brand new work in this art fair. And um, I believe right now live there's APAD art fair going on in New York City. Um, which is the largest art fair in the United States. And, you know, is, is a collector, you go there to acquire work. And um, there's often the collector, that's the person writing the check, oftentimes. Um, then there's the curator, that is often maybe from a museum that's doing the head nod to say, yes, collector, if you buy this, we will accept this maybe in one year or two years or five years. Um, and then there's the gallerist that is part of the transaction, right? They receive commission. And then there's the artist who also is the recipient of the funds from the sale of the artwork. So it, it's, it's more than just one person or two people working together. There's generally a team. And uh, so that's kind of a simplistic version of that. Um, you know, you might ask yourself, well, how do you get your work into a museum? Um, collection. And I would say, you know, as an artist, the, the focus really is on creating good work. 
Um, I think the good curators that it is their job to seek out new work, um, contemporary work, especially if they're collecting contemporary museum. Now, having said that, many will, if you meet them at portfolio reviews or through a friend or through a collector, um, and you know you have a good relationship. Maybe they exhibit your work as a solo exhibition. And this um, happened uh, last year where I had a venue book me um, at the Oklahoma State University Museum of Art. And I have a show opening next month. And um, they had a great experience through the booking process and they generally book a year or two out. Um, and then um, I, uh, just before the show, I asked him, I said, Hey, you know, would you ever be interested in, um, as a token of appreciation, um, you know, an artist proof of one of my silver gelatin prints and the curator said, yes. And I was like, wow. And so I package it up nicely, ship it down there. And there it is. You can list that museum institution on your, um, curriculum vitae or your CV, which I'll talk about coming up. All right. Um, I would also encourage you to explore some of these virtual art platforms. Um, the biggest one I would say out there is Artsy, um, and you may or may not have heard of it, but this thing called Artsy is essentially um, kind of like an online marketplace for art. Artists can't sell their work directly. It's only through galleries, and the galleries pay a premium to be featured. Um, but there's curators that will show the latest shows out there. Um, there'll be secondary market sales that will be on there. Uh, you can sell work if you're a collector potentially on there through auctions. Um, but, you know, artists will have the, maybe their own page, for example. And this is what mine looks like, where if I've had recent shows where my work has been exhibited um, in galleries or art fair booths or, um, or benefit auctions, for example, they'll be listed there. Um, and it, it, on this at this point in time here earlier this year, I had 45 followers. And that's a big number of followers in my mind, because that means there's 45 people out there that are interested if I have new work work that are able to see that um, uh, uh, if they're scrolling on their app, right? So number seven, I would say is include a certificate of authenticity when you ship and deliver your work. Um, and I would say deliver your work with professionalism. So I'll show you what that looks like. All right. And what a certificate of authenticity looks like and talk briefly about why you should use one. Okay, so this is my template for a certificate of authenticity. It has my branding on the top. Um, it has a thumbnail. I, I use mine as black and white. Um, so it's not like a reproduction of the artwork. Um, it's more of a, a document. Um, I have the full title of the artwork and um, my name. I have the sheet size, which is often different than the image size. Okay, so that's helpful if you're matting the work or custom framing the work. I have the date the artwork was created, and then I have the, in parentheses the date that it was printed. So those often can be two different dates. I list the type of paper. Um, I list the edition information uh, from the series, and then I sign this document. Um, and so that I put in little sleeves. And um, so if the collector orders a, a print from me, um, they open up this thing called a master pack, M-A-S-T-E-R-P-A-K, and they might see if they have two prints here, uh, you'll see there's two certificates of authenticity. And um, their little three ring binder holes, so if they have a three ring binder, they can collect those safely. Um, otherwise, they can just tape them to the back of the photograph after that they're framed. Um, and so here you can see what those look like. And I find that way if um, there's ever any question, you know, let's say the collector fast forward 30 years passes away, um, then at least the person who's trying to figure out what this artwork is, what's an addition of, um, you know, when was it sold? When was it, you know, printed? This sort of, it gives that, um, whether it be a curator at a museum, um, gives, gives, um, the next collector per se, uh, some more information uh, that they would not otherwise know just by looking at the artwork. Um, and so I think it helps just kind of keeping good records, keeping things organized. I think um, it's easier to do it on the front end than the back, okay? 
Um, this is a print that actually went directly to the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, this was a gallery that just recently closed. I was super sad. I've worked with them for four years, Burnett Fine Art and Advisory. And so you can see how I've uh, used the, my archival pigment print. Uh, they, it is in uh, non-PVC kind of archival sleeves and plastic. And then I use gentle cores um, with cardboard and uh, non-residue leading tape. Um, not like gaffer tape, so it's not, not that, it's, um, but it's acid free and that, um, that way. And this, this print was being hand delivered. Um, so I didn't have the extra black. You could pay a little extra for the, the like puncture resistance. Um, I back up here, you can see it in black. That's like the puncture resistance. Just again, if you're shipping it to protect the artwork so it doesn't arrive damaged. Um, but if it's hand delivered, this is a typical way I can deliver that. And you can see kind of how the print is uh, presented. Um, and I keep a file on my computer that um, I reuse as the editions go out, my certificate of, of authenticities so that I don't have to start from scratch every time. Um, so I'll copy and paste, I'll give it a new name, change the edition information um, and that sort of thing. So, okay. So number six, how to build your curriculum vitae um, CV for short, with intent. Now, the CV is very much of an academic practice. Um, it shows kind of both the breadth and depth of your practice uh, in terms of publications, exhibitions, which is research, right, from an academic perspective. And so if you're an artist um, that's a teaching faculty member at an institution, that CV is really important for like when you go up for tenure, for example. Uh, but it also shows like, let's say, something happens to you and you die, um, and we're all gonna die, and then it gives a, a good track record of where your work has been exhibited. It, it's it's kind of like the Wikipedia on steroids, if you will. So I'm gonna quickly go through what a CV, what my CV looks like. Um, I list at the top my education, um, solo exhibitions. Um, those are really, the I think, the, the, the creme de la creme, if you will, of where your work is being shared and seen. Um, often these take years to um, plan, and so it really does show intent. Um, I think if you have war, awards or grants that you've received, listing those, um, I think keeping your CV up to date, so I sometimes will have an up-to-date updated. I show kind of your group exhibitions, and I feel like this is really kind of the backbone often in the work in the art world is that um, art doesn't exist in a, in a, in a vacuum. Um, art is often hung in visual conversation with other artwork. And so if there's group shows that have a particular theme that have been put together by a curator, I feel like that adds value that um, your work exists in a con visual conversation with other artists' works of the day. Um, so I, I, I think that's a really important thing. Um, they can't often be thought of as a pay-to-play game, if you will, because it, it takes a lot of time and energy and costs if you're applying for shows, um, but they are investments in, in, in your career. Um, I list your publications, photographs, and then, of course, any press that you might have received as um, reviews of your artwork or exhibitions. Um, if you have any um, public or private collections, you can list those in a separate section. I generally list them alphabetical, um, or uh, your exhibitions can be listed chronological. I often think reverse chron chronological is important. And then if you're working with any galleries, um, gallery representation. So that's essentially what I use for my CV. Um, as you grow, I think keeping your um, CV up to date quarterly, um, you know, every six months, I think is a good practice. That way, if two years go by, then it's not this daunting task of like trying to figure out what I have to do. So number five, it kind of goes back to this, what I just mentioned about keeping good records, keeping track of everything. I think that is vital. And um, I have a special guest here that I'm going to introduce you to. I, I interviewed him. Um, his name is Adger Cowens. And he was born in 1936. Um, he was one of the first um, students to get a degree in photography. And he worked under Gordon Parks at Life Magazine. Um, and if you, um, I think the Blue, Bruce Silverstein Gallery in New York has a portfolio of his you can go see. Very um, inspiration uh, to me. And um, I wanted to, I asked him a couple questions a few weeks ago um, about 
you know, collecting in his archive. So um, you can bear, hopefully you can hear uh, the audio and video, and it's only about a minute or so long. So I'm going to go ahead and take it away, Adger. Here we are, the man, the legend, the myth, Adger Cohen. If you were to give yourself some advice about keeping track of your archive, what advice would you give your 30-year-old self? Keep very good records. Organize your stuff when you shoot it. Organize it right away. Put it in a file. And if you don't do that, and it's all over the place, when you get to be my age, you've got a lot of problems. And you had a birthday last year. Mm -hmm. we were, last time we were a couple of six. Woo. So keep your stuff organized in fowls and very organized. If you got portraits of animals and animals, if you got portraits of news and news, mm -hmm. put things where you can find it. Mm -hmm. And don't put everything in one place. Mm -hmm. Put them in files and then download them. What about, because you're a film shooter, how did yeah. you keep track of like your negatives? You have like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem, that's the problem I'm having now. Yeah. Because I just shot the negatives and put a number on them. Mm -hmm. That's not good enough. You have to organize it. So if you've got portraits, then you should be in portraits. You know, if it's nature, then it should be in nature. If it's like sunrises or sunsets or this is, it's got to so be keywording is yeah. important. Yeah. Okay. It's very important because when you get to be older, you don't remember half the stuff that you got. But if you have it organized, you can go right to it and download it to, uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like on the computer? Like, yeah, from the computer to a... Like an external hard drive? External back hard drive. Yep. Yeah. And back things have up. Yeah. Different external hard drive. And it's good to keep it in two or even three places. Mm -hmm. And when you put it in that third place, you don't even go there. You don't even look at it. You just leave it there. So you know where it is, you plug it in, you find it. Yeah. And if they're high-res files, make them high-res. Because if you have low-res files, you know, you got a problem. Cool. You may have a nice Emmys, but you can't do that. Well, thank you, thank you. All right. Yeah, good old Azure. He was awesome. Um, and so I, I, I loved what he was saying about making his backups and knowing that this um, presentation was supported by SanDisk. I wanted to give a quick overview of what I use and how I use it. So after, when I'm creating my work, um, that's generally written to the media, either Compact Flash Card or Compact Flash Express or SD uh, card. After I'm done shooting, if I'm not shooting tethered, which means directly to the computer via like a USB-C cord. Um, I download it on the computer. And after that, then I have three different hard drives that I use. Um, they're both rated, um, and this would be on site. So that would mean that they're redundant data on different drives. Um, so that if one side, if one drive di dies, there's a duplicate side that's available to access. Um, and then I would put those once I'm uh, also on a standard hard drive um, that I use on site as well. So at least they're in two different places on site. Um, and I will often travel with that standard hard drive as well. Um, and then two to three times a year, I will back everything up off site. And that's kind of an archive. So I know there are at least two places backed up at least two different drives. One of them's rated. And then offsite, one of them rated as well. And so I wanted to show what this might actually look like in a working scenario for me. Um, this was a commission portrait uh, session about a month ago, at beginning of March. Um, and I was shooting tethered, and it was um, through the G drive that automatically back, you know, it's very secure. So I would write to my primary drive and they would um, back up directly to that drive. So in case, say for example, my laptop crashed <laughs> during the shoot, I knew that the files were safe. Then when I get, um, uh, I was also shooting with cards in camera. And so I used the Sandist Extreme cards, which I'm shooting on the phase one IQ4, which is 151 megabytes, uh, mega, megapixels, excuse me. So the file sizes are ginormous. So the write speed for those um, CF cards, that media was was awesome. It kept right up. I was able to shoot, you know, one frame a second and had no problem keeping that up. 
Um, and I shoot with two dual backups um, in, in camera as well. So if I have to grab the camera and untether it to go shoot something more uh, nimble on my hand, then I know that um, um, I'm still having shooting to two media cards at once. So I have an SD card and my CF Express card, um, and I use duplicate so uh, data. So um, one's not just JPEG, but there's two duplicate raw files going to each uh, media. So that just gives me some peace of mind, which I like. Um, so that's kind of my, my gist on staying organized, um, be mindful of your media flow. I realized you could probably spend an entire workshop uh, going over this, and we just don't have that time for today for that. So, um, so number four on um, how do you create value working with fine art photography co uh, collectors? Well, I think connect with them. It's really important. They're human beings. I think um, they like to support you as the artist. And um, they're your fans, as I mentioned. And so staying in touch with them is how I think long-term relationships build in value as well. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little story about how this came to be. I was at the Houston Center for Photography, which is a wonderful community down in Texas. Um, and it was a, a print that I had donated in terms of their gala auction. So I'm sitting here at the table. And I, I, I only knew two or three people at the table. Um, and the person sitting next to me, I introduced myself. And, uh, and then I said briefly a little bit about my work. And I call that my little 15, 20 second spiel. And she's like, oh my gosh, I know your work. And um, fast forward, not even 15 minutes, I had a portfolio of my work um, in the other room. And she, I, she acquired this print. We uh, did it literally a credit card swipe right there. And if I was not in that place, that, that relationship uh, wouldn't have been forged. And if I wasn't prepared to bring work, then that sale wouldn't have happened. So it's often, it's kind of just doing your good work, being oftentimes at the right place um, and at the right time and just being prepared and be yourself. And um, that was just a wonderful, genuine, everyone was excited. It was this event. Um, and that I just think is, was kind of a really win-win situation. Um, you know, if, if you have opportunities to exhibit your work, I think, you know, offer to do an artist talk. Um, oftentimes they will, you, you can get paid through what's called an honorarium. Um, that's very common. Also with virtual talks or um, virtual book signings, I think during lockdown, we're starting to be more common. Um, but book signing events are a wonderful way to meet your fans. I mean, imagine if you had a favorite author and you they were going to come to talk at your local bookstore and you can get a book signed by them and ask them a question or two. That makes you excited. And that is part of that emotional um, connection that is you know, connected to that work. Um, and, uh, but I also say, and I have a whole, a whole uh, presentation on books coming up, but I say, you know, there's really no money in books. Um, there's a lot of money to make a book, but it's hard to get that money out. So know the value of that book. Um, uh, you know, especially if you, if they buy a, a print or two from you, you know, offer to don't give them a book. Um, Teaching a workshop, much like this experience here. Um, granted, I don't teach to make money. Um, there's not a lot of money to be made in teaching, unfortunately. Um, but there are a way for you to connect and build collectors. Um, I know a lot of photographers that collect photography. And, um, you know, I, I did one virtual book signing event during lockdown. And that, um, I think it paid me $500 um, for 45 minutes of talking and, and I maybe sold a few books. So that was that was really nice. Um, another big example I'll give you and uh, is offer to do what's called like a collector night. Um, maybe if you're in a new city. Um, and this notion is like you kind of create this exclusive atmosphere within these VIP mindset. So maybe produce a postcard, mail it out. Someone's going to host, maybe offer to um, pay for wine and cheese, um, sparkling water, that sort of thing, um, and bring your portfolio case um, and even some packaging sleeves potentially. Um, but don't feel like if you sell a print that they have to carry it home with them. I would say you can offer to ship it to them at no additional cost. Um, so I think that's a really nice that people feel like they get to meet the artists in a social environment with friends. And um, I like that. Um, so, you know, big picture, I think, you know, thinking strategically, um, you know, 
don't just, if you make a sale, um, selling some of your artwork, just don't go spend it all on like new camera gear. <laughs> as much as I love VH photo, I also realize like I like to think of the income I generate from artwork sales is like seed money. And how how can I grow that over time? Um, and I think going to portfolio reviews, same thing. I talk about that coming up at another workshop where there are, there are costs involved, um, but that the relationships and the friendships over time are really priceless. Um, and to use Ben Franklin's phrase, a penny saved is penny earned, you know, keeping that in mind as you're making these decisions on, you know, what to invest in, whether it be a new, new camera, a trip to create new work, uh, a new printer, or going to portfolio reviews, or putting a portfolio of work together, even, okay? Um, I, I always, there's this formula that I created. Um, it's like the inbound effect um, is greater than the outbound effect. And what do I mean by that? Is the inbound effect would be like the friends that you already have, whether you met other reviewers, photo editors, book publishers at portfolio reviews, for example, um, and maybe you've stayed in touch with them. You know, so you have five really good peeps, I'll say. That will be far more influential, I feel like, than if you just have 25 people that you know they met with you once and you haven't stayed in touch with them. Um, so I think forging those relationships, building on that network is really important um, and gives opportunity for you to connect with your audience. Um, so again, the, the inbound effect or those that you've nurtured, um, maybe they've awarded your work um, in exhibitions or photo contests, um, you know, the friends and family or corporate art consultants, right? So those you continue to nurture over time versus, you know, the, yes, new relationships are important, that outbound effect, um, but it's like, those are new people that you've just met. Um, you know, you never want to pressure someone to buy anything. I think, you know, if anything, they want um, to feel like you're, you're coming from a good spot, you're genuine. Um, and so, you know, your goal is to try to convert them over time, making them, you know, a friend, right? Um, I have a worksheet that I've developed that if you're interested in learning more about this, um, send me an email, rj at rjkern.com. Um, and I'll, get, I'll show you quickly what it looks like, and then we're going to move on. Um, so it's a little PDF workshop on um, how you can expand your network. And I talk about like little thinking about people that in your network that can support you, that could add value to your life, and then how you can share that with others as well, and then how to reach out to them, where you would find those people. Um, and then I also give some you know suggestions on how to share knowledge, whether it be sharing books, um, I, I'm a big fan of books and sharing books as well. Um, and then opportunities for deeper connections. So maybe you've missed an opportunity standing in line at the airport. That person could have been a collector um, or just someone who's looking for a new piece of artwork. So maybe just, you know, how to um, come up with good conversations with people that you may not have um, met before. I think that's a skill that can be de developed. So that little PDF can kind of hopefully help you with some, do some thinking. Um, so kind of a transitioning to, you know, connecting with collectors. Um, I think newsletters are a very efficient um, way of doing that. I personally use Squarespace and I really like their email newsletter uh, functionality. Um, but it's like your collectors want to hear from you. They're your fans. And so, for example, if you get in, um, invited into a um, a exhibition. This was the Atlanta Celebrates Photography Gala Brunch and Auction. Um, and I was a featured artist that I donated a print in. Um, and so when I'm excited, when I find out about this, I'll create a little graphic and I'll use maybe use their logo and whatnot. Um, and in that way, when you're excited about it, you um, it feels like less work, right? And then I'll put that on my news section on my website. And so then that way it's got some the who, what, when, why, where details, um, and then um, at least that's all in one spot. And I use this better than like Facebook or Instagram in terms of sharing events, because I don't want to fill up people's page with, you know, look at me doing this and that. But then this way people can go to see what, what I'm, I'm up to. 
Um, and if there's a museum acquisition, for example, I'll take the image itself or the object that's being acquired by the museum. I'll use the museum's logo. I'll try to put that really important information about like what edition number it is, what size it is. You know, and on the right, this is the collector's edition of my first monograph, The Sheep and the Goats. Um, I'll list the publisher and what edition number it is and so on. Um, and then I will, after I create like that post, I could share that on social media um, or I put it on my blog or news section. But then you've already done a lot of the hard work. Then, you, you, you know, over time, every quarter, for example, you can then easily go back into your um, news section of your website. And that way um, you set up your newsletter and you draw from those assets. So then hopefully you have a website, maybe you have a contact page. So you want, so if someone goes to your website, they can sign up. Um, here's my quarterly newsletters, you know, first name, boom, boom. And uh, make sure that they can unsubscribe too. You don't want to spam them with your newsletter. Um, I generally send mine out four times a year. Um, I, I like not to compete with holidays as well. So I've chosen the spring equinox, summer solstice, fall equinox, and winter solstice. Um, and that tends to space things out nicely, um, but it's really up to you. Um, but I always try to have a little humor, a little warmth and humanity in your newsletters, um, making sure that they're reflecting who you are. I think it's really important. Um, this is what one of my newsletters looked like recently. And I'll put um, a photograph of you know, me holding a piece of artwork so people have a sense of scale, what that artwork looks like. And I'll share, um, again, looks kind of familiar, right? Because that was on my news section. So I put that in my newsletter. So it makes it less daunting. Like, oh my God, I spent eight hours right, putting this thing together. Um, then it's just more of a formatting and creating inbound links and outbound links and such. Um, so again, I, I like doing top 10 highlights. Um, there tend to be an easier read. It's not a lot of text. Um, and I try to have a little image in with each section. Um, so that's that's just what I do. I found that works. Um, I'm surprised to see how quickly people read a newsletter too. Like once I send it out, like within a few hours, you know, it's just like, wow, 50% of my, my newsletter group have already looked at it. I mean, that's way better than um, often sending out social media announcements that people miss things. So um, so the second one, second number two, that my, we're whittling down the list of uh, ways that you, the artist, can help create value for photography collectors. I say be really creative about installing your work um, on a wall. And when I say, you know, creative about installing your work, it doesn't have to be in a white wall. It doesn't have to be in a wall either. It could be outside. It could be, you know, a traveling exhibition um, on, on canvas. Um, I've seen very compelling uh, exhibitions of photographs that are printed on um, fabric that are hanging from trees. Um, so you can be really creative and I would encourage you to do that. Uh, this show just came down recently at the Watermark Art Center and there are large prints. These are 43 by 53 inches from my project, The Unchosen Ones. And the images on the far left are diptychs and you'll see that there's no glazing. There's no like glass or acrylic. Um, I've handmade these uh, frames that are magnets, and I'm more than happy to have an offline conversation about how I do my uh, frames. But that way, the, the exhibition can ship relatively inexpensively, um, but it also speaks to the subject matter. Um, for this particular project, I was photographing the kids that did not win at their county fairs and empathy was a really important part of that. So I wanted the work to be fragile, much like my subjects were fragile. And so that that worked for me. Um, and, but having you know, creative presentations, I think makes your work again, more and more, more memorable. Um, it gives the sense of um, objecthood. When you look at art, I think that's important that it's not just this image, but it's a representation of all these decisions you've made as an artist, right? The type of lighting you're using, um, the type of camera you're using, the lenses, right? Your software, uh, type of printer you're using, all of that is all can be seen in the final artwork. So I think having that presentation in mind, um, for me, helped under get through my mind like, oh, I, there's a reason I'd like to light work or shoot medium format. Um, because I know the quality in the final output is really important. Um, 
But some different ways you can think too about hanging your work, um, even with traditional mats and glass frames, is more like the salon style work, that it's um, different sizes, maybe even different types of frames. But there's a couple different rules I think it's important. Um, don't overwhelm your viewer with just like visual cacophony. Have some sort of structure to the salon style, and I think that helps it make it work. Here you'll see there's a middle line and that everything, uh, the work here is hanging along the, uh, the, the top row is all um, aligned by the bottom and the bottom row is aligned by the top part of the frame. And then there's this kind of grid that's, um, they're kind of equally spaced. And I think that helps give that visual continuity to the art. With the same work, you could experiment doing, you know, a top hang and a bottom hang, but then the left and the right are center justified. Again, gives him some structure to the work. Um, this is a pattern that I really liked as well. Um, I have two shapes, so a square and a rectangle, and I believe two sizes, kind of a small and a large. And so that worked visually pretty well. And then this is what I actually worked with. Uh, this is a recent hang that I did um, in my upstairs of uh, some personal work. And, um, you know, these were, gosh, this was 15 years of personal family portraits. So thank goodness we had good hard drives that uh, um, kept the data safe. And, uh, but it gave kind of a creative way to install it. Um, I have a couple examples I wanted to share with you. My friend Sig Harvey. This was her installation um, shared on her website. At, uh, this was up in Maine. And you can see where she's using, again, these similar bottom line work, squares. She's using text in her work. So it's not just that traditional hanging. Um, painting walls can be really uh, a different visual impact as well. Um, Pier 24, they're in San Francisco. I believe they just announced closure. Um, but this was work by Richard Leroy, where you can see they've done that similar rule where there's a format, a formula in, in terms of installing work um, that visually like it's the sum of the parts are greater than the whole uh, or the whole are greater than the sum of the parts. That's what I meant. Um, here's a more traditional way. And if you go to art fairs like at APAD, you'll see this is quite common um, that the art will have some um, like almost like these ups and downs or like these little crescendos of how um, the work is hung on the walls, which is a decision, I feel like. I love this install. This kind of breaks all the rules, but still works where you have kind of a top left, bottom and right justification of alignment. And then the work in between uh, fits. This was at Pier 24. But this exhibition was all about music and that visual kind of stimulus that comes from the music world and these art photographs about music. So I feel like in that sense, that salon style worked really well. All right, so my final little point um, for creating good value for your collectors is create a memorial, ex memorable experience. Um, maybe that is not just is your traditional, hey, there's a gallery opening and we've got our glass of cheap wine and crackers and cheese, but give them something maybe a little different. And I wanna use a case study that worked really well for me. Um, I did a houseboat pop-up show. Um, we, myself and two other friends, um, we rented a houseboat on the Seine River during Perry Photo. Again, this is the largest art fair for photography. And this was last November. And what we did was my Jamie Johnson, uh, myself, and then Dotan Sagi, who's been on here uh, BNH for a while. And the three of us um, offered that we all had published our first books about the same time frame, and we had kept our proof prints for the, that work. And so for one night only, um, the, the, the scarcity, that value was in time, right? It wasn't in price or quantity, but uh, we were offering signed prints for $99, uh, 99 euros, and it was right near the Grand Palais um, in Paris. And uh, so we, we came out with these little postcards that we produced on Moo. Um, the back of them were all the same design with the address. Um, and uh, the front of them had an image representative of our work. And so we sent out a little emails to people as well. Here we are on the actual boat where the houseboat party was. And uh, I wanna show you, this is, this is what it looked like here. Um, I think this is a little video. Nope, 
Here's a little video. So there's the Eiffel Tower. The Roman Park. Something on the so the door tans work. Is it like a big one? But I can, I can, yes, I can, I can put it on. I'm so curious about where you go. I do love it. So that, you know, people love that. It was very low key. There wasn't high pressure sales techniques involved. Um, some collectors, they never thought they self, never thought they would love to collect artwork and they acquired work for their house. Um, uh, decor that gives them inspiration and connects at an emotional level from this experience. And so I found that that was a really thinking out of the box, different approach. Um, and that it offered value to collectors as well. So at this point, I would say we've got a few minutes. If there are questions, um, I'm happy to entertain those questions. Great. We uh, we have one question that has come in, uh, and it's from Steve. And basically, he's asking a couple questions that he has gotten different answers from um, over the years. The first one is, is there a difference in the value of photographic image by how it was printed, either by the creator or versus someone else? All right. I, well, Steve, thanks for writing in. Um, you know, to be honest, that's a good question. Um, you know, Ansel Adams, I know he he was the author of his negatives. So he created the digital black and white negatives and that he would do some of his own printing, but he would also have someone else that would print. Um, I think he was a big fan of that half the art was in the dark room. However, the dark room technician's role is also that of a technician. It's very technical. And I think in the dark room, I think it's they I think collectors like to know like the artist produced this potentially in the dark room themselves with or by supervision of the artist. I think that's the key. Um, in the digital realm, I think very much the same. It's either produced by the artist or it was produced under the supervision of the artist. And so I sp specify that in my art, uh, certificate of authenticity that, yes, this was, in fact, produced by the artist under or under my supervision. Um, and that's why signing it is very important. It's like this um, authentic way of like the artist did approve this as their original artwork or addition to artwork for sale. Um, you know, you could give credit if if you worked with a master printer. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be on the print per se. And so it's really up to you. But for me, if I if I had a big fan um, personal of of like a collector, like I, I have artwork behind me that I love to collect. Um, I do like to know that like the hand of the artists was in using that um, the chemistry the techniques, the creative decisions that go into that final piece of artwork. I like knowing that the artist was a part of that. So that's important. Um, looks like the second question is a gallery required to disclose by whom that image was printed? No, now galleries don't usually care uh, as long as the artist signs the artwork um, and you can use a sticker label as well. I was advised don't just sign an addition all your work and ship it out. I say, wait until the work sells that's when the addition is established. So sign the work, put a year on the print itself, and then on the certificate of authenticity, that's what establishes the addition number, okay? Um, and Bruce, ah, thank you so much for your kind words and uh, I'm glad you can uh, and join us. So, all right. All right. Yeah. We are at almost exactly the hour. You hit the mark exactly. So that was Perfect. fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm um, glad to be here, Pete. Thanks again for hosting. Yeah. And uh, uh, for those that want to, um, you know, receive that little worksheet PDF, email me rj at rjkern.com and uh, we'll go from there. So yeah, and care. RJ, I believe we have another one of these. I want to say April 4th. Yeah. April 4th. Yep. We have another uh, event okay. with you. And then we have another one in early what is it, May, when is the third one in this series? Oh, April 27th. Yep, so two next month in 
April yeah, 2022. So we have two next months. So sign up for those and we will see all of you then as well. And we'll see you back, uh, RJ, as well. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Pete. Take care, yep. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, B&H.